What up space fam, Golden here for Anime Uproar. Today we are going to be going over every Sin's backstory. A good story is vital for a character, and the 7 Deadly Sins series has some of the best backstories I've come across, so I'm extremely excited about this video, especially with the new 7 Deadly Sins season now airing. If you're hyped for the new season and want to see more 7 Deadly Sins videos on this channel, make sure to smash that like button to let me know. If you haven't, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you actually get notified when new 7 Deadly Sins videos come out. Also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AnimeUproar for more content and crucial updates, like information about new trailers and new seasons. On the day this video is released, I will be conducting a tournament bracket via Instagram stories for which Sin's backstory is the best. You can vote on Instagram at AnimeUproar, link in the description. If you're not watching within the first 24 hours, never fear, I will have more tournament brackets like these in the future. So make sure you're following us on Instagram at AnimeUproar, link in the description. Anyways, there will be some manga spoilers in this video about the secret pasts of the Sins. You've been warned, and now without further ado, let's jump into it. This is gonna be in random order, so I might as well start with Bon, one of my favorite characters in all of anime. Bon started out as a poor kid who had crappy parents. At best they ignored him and at worst they beat him really bad. They sent him out to steal for them and would even beat him if they thought he kept the food he stole for himself. So not only did his parents not provide for him, Bon was forced to feed them. Bon even had a fear of falling asleep as a kid because his dad would kick him in the stomach if he saw him sleeping and not stealing. He'd get so hungry sometimes that he would even eat his own puke. One of the saving graces of Bond's life was his kind little sister, who used to follow him around everywhere he went. But at the age of 4, she died from starvation. So yeah, saying that Bond's upbringing was tough is an understatement. For most of us, Bond's story should put our own challenges into perspective. Nobody's life is perfect, but chances are your parents didn't beat you when you tried to fall asleep, and you didn't have to watch the only person you loved starve to death at a young age. However, Bond's life began to turn around when Zhivago entered the picture. He was the good father figure that Bond never had. They met in prison of all places. Zhivago offered Bond food. This was already weird because most people just try to take things from him without ever giving anything in return. Then Zhivago helped Bond escape from the prison and took him to his hideout, where he gave him even more food. Later, Bond got tricked and kidnapped. He was going to be delivered to some crazy aristocrat who loves to torture kids. We never actually met this aristocrat as far as I know, all we got was this passing reference. But if you stop and reflect for a second, you'll realize how unbelievably messed up the world Bond grew up in was. It's a world where someone who is known to do such horrendous things not only gets away with it, but has people eager to help him get more victims. Luckily, Zhivago happened to be robbing the guys that kidnapped Bond and managed to accidentally save Bond in the process. Again, he fed Bon. Then, Bon asked him to teach him how to steal. Since he had to steal anyway, he might as well get good at it since he was just getting caught and beaten up over and over again at the time. Now, I want to say that the moments between Bon and Zhivago are definitely some of the most touching in the entire series, and we get one after Zhivago agrees to teach Bon to steal. Bon is nodding off, but he reveals that he doesn't want to fall asleep because, as mentioned, his old man will kick him in the stomach. However, Zhivago says he'll watch over Bon and lets him rest on his lap. Bon has a good sleep for probably the first time in his life, and it's even more heartwarming when you consider that Zhivago just has to chill there, sitting, because if he moves, he might wake up Bon. It's like when you go out of your way to rest in an uncomfortable position because your pet is resting on you and it looks comfortable, so you don't want to disturb it. This whole time, Zhivago has been going out of his way to help Bon, and it's all the more impactful because of the stark contrast between his selfless behavior and Bon's real father's deeply flawed and selfish behavior. We get some funny panels in the manga of Bon and Zhivago stealing together. Bon gets caught and we see Zhivago humorously rescuing him carrying him over his shoulders. Zhivago, at this point, also tells Bon about the Fountain of Youth in the Fairy King's Forest. As if he didn't owe Zhivago enough, it's interesting to think that Bon might have never met the love of his life Elaine if not for Zhivago telling him about the Fountain of Youth and the Fairy King's Forest. Later, Bon and Zhivago are talking about Zhivago's other son, Celion. Bon looks a bit embarrassed and jealous until Zhivago tells him he also has a kid who looks and sounds rough and standoffish named Bon. I am literally not lying when I say that just revisiting this part in the manga got my eyes to water as I'm writing this. This part is just so touching. 
After hearing that Zhivago views him as a son, Bond's face goes red and he shyly looks down. It's the nicest thing anyone has ever said to him, and it's music to his ears. Zhivago tells Bond never to trust anyone, but Bond says he trusts Zhivago, and Zhivago can't help but hug the boy. Then he shoves his head in a playful way and tells him to get some sleep because they're thieving early in the morning. The next morning, Bond can't help but smile. He's so happy that he finally has a father who cares about him. Since Zhivago's late, Bond decides that he'll go ahead and rob the house on his own, so that Zhivago will be surprised and praise him. However, he gets caught and beaten up. It turns out that Zhivago was late because he overslept. Then, as he's rushing to get to Bond, he finds out that his werefox son in the mountains has been discovered. You see, Zhivago was a werefox this whole time. He sees Bond getting beaten up and it's excruciating seeing the look on his tortured face as he tries to decide which one of his sons to go help. Then he turns into his werefox form and with tears in his eyes apologizes to Bond as he turns and goes to rescue his biological son. As he's running, tears are streaming down his face, and Bond's words ring through his head. I trust you, Zhivago, end quote. Zhivago considers himself to be a despicable man for abandoning Bond. In the end, he was too late to save his biological son's life too. He was too scared to return to the village because he was afraid to learn that Bond had been killed too. Although Zhivago didn't come back, Bond survived and never bore a grudge against him. He always thought of him as the best father he could have asked for. Later, a 23-year-old Bond remembers Zhivago's story and visits the Fairy King's forest in order to steal the Fountain of Youth. Bond's life wasn't that good up to this point, so he thought that if he gained immortality, something good would eventually happen to him. A hopeful yet somehow depressing thought. Bond keeps trying to get to the Fountain of Youth, but Elaine, the fairy who protects the fountain, keeps sending him flying away, Team Rocket style. Eventually, the persistent Bond uses his three-section staff to bring the cup to him. But before he can drink it, Elaine uses tree branches to restrain him. Elaine explains to Bond that without the Fountain of Youth, the entire forest would wither away. Bond says he's got it, he won't try to steal it anymore. Elaine doesn't trust that a selfish human would give up so easily, so she reads his mind and realizes that he's telling the truth. Elaine explains to Bond that she's been watching the forest in place of her absent fairy king brother for 700 years, and nothing good happened all that time. Thus, Bond can't even be sure that something good will happen to him if he lives for eternity. Wow, that's harsh. Luckily though, the good thing that they were both waiting for is actually their meeting. They quickly take a liking to each other. They talk, and Elaine starts to feel sad at the thought that Bond will leave her. She says to herself, and I quote, I wish Bond didn't come here to steal the Fountain of Youth, but instead came for me. Bond is actually nearby and overhears her. He responds, then how about I do that? End quote. Bond has also developed feelings for Elaine. As he explains, he doesn't get along well with other folks, and she actually took the time to listen to him. Bond promises to bring her brother back and free her from her lonely guardian duties. Then, Elaine hugs Bond, only the second time we've seen him hugged by someone. However, this side story doesn't have such a happy ending. A red demon attacks the forest. Bond takes his heart out with his snatch ability and thinks he's killed it, but demons actually have multiple hearts. All he did was attract the demon's attention. Then the red demon shoots lasers out of his eyes and gives both Bond and Elaine mortal wounds. Elaine tries to give Bond the Fountain of Youth so that he can survive, but he insists that she drink it. Elaine seems to drink it, but then kisses Bond and in this way passes the fluid into his mouth. Definitely one of the most epic kisses ever. Bond, with his newfound immortal powers, kills the Red Demon. Then, Elaine dies in his arms. She died in part because he was there and attracted the Red Demon's attention to them. So Bond can't help but blame himself for her death. He considers it a sin that is too great to ever atone for. But still, he swears to Elaine that he will steal her away one day. It'll just be from the world of the dead, rather than from the Fairy King's forest. Bond goes on to replant the Fairy King's forest elsewhere for Elaine, and the fairies start referring to this human as the new Fairy King. He occasionally comes to give his blood to the forest, so that the Fountain of Youth inside him can keep the forest healthy. As the authorities usually do, they get things extremely mixed up. They blame Bond for killing Elaine in order to satisfy his own greed for immortality. Bond, who does blame himself for Elaine's death, doesn't try to clear up the misunderstanding. He now wants to be punished. He wants to feel physical pain and torture because that might take attention away from the emotional anguish he's experiencing. They try to execute Bond a total of 33 times, but they obviously never succeed because he's immortal. You have to respect their persistence though. You'd think 
think that they'd give up after the first or second time had no effect. About four years later, Meliodas comes to get Bon out of prison. Bon, who has no idea who Meliodas is, reveals that he is in prison on purpose. However, Meliodas uses force to get him to come out, and Bon gets excited by Meliodas' power. He decides to tag along so he can continue to fight the captain. About a year later, Bon goes through a phase of stealing stuffed animals from the children of the kingdom. King is furious and returns them all, and starts to follow Bon all the time to ensure that he doesn't do something like that again. Although they mess with each other, it's clear that these two make a good team. And at this time, Bon has no idea that King is Elaine's sister, and King has no idea that Bon was there when his sister died. At some point, Bond is messing around and tries to steal Meliodas' sword. The captain is not having it though and gives Bond the wound on his neck and face that never heals. It's the only scar he has on his immortal regenerating body. Ten years before the main story takes place, the seven deadly sins are framed for Zaratras' death and, on the captain's orders, they disperse. After not hearing from Meliodas for a while, Bond hears rumors that he's dead. As he did upon Elaine's death, he intentionally lets himself be imprisoned. It is during this capture that he loses his sacred treasure. His reason for going to prison is that he wants to feel pain that can make him feel alive again. He's been through so much pain after losing Zhivago, Elaine, and Meliodas that he's become numb to almost everything. While he's in prison, he breaks out every so often to give his blood to the Fairy King's forest, and then comes back to be tortured some more. And this is what his existence is, until he's introduced into the main story. It appears that unbearable emotional anguish turned him into the masochist we know today. Next, let's look at Gother's backstory. Gother is a doll created by the demon Gother, who used to be the commandment of selflessness over 3000 years ago. He created Gother so that he could experience the outside world through the doll from Demon Prison. However, Doll Gother also has a Pinocchio mode where he can also function as his own person. Just like Pinocchio, the Demon Gother loves his doll as if he was his own biological child. The doll was even made in the image of his old lover, but the demon changed the sex of the doll so that he wouldn't get any impure thoughts. The Demon Gother uses the Doll Gother in order to help him break out of prison. Then he has the doll help him cast the most powerful of Genjutsus. They make everyone believe that the Archangel Mael is actually the demon Estorosa, and in this way they put a temporary stop to the Holy War. The demon Gother uses all of his power to cast this forbidden spell, and as a result he dies in front of his doll. He asks the Gother doll to realize a dream he could not, which may be in part to establish a lasting and just peace in the world. The Gother doll, who we'll just call Gother from now on, disappears and Fraudrin takes his place as the commandment of selflessness. Fast forward to some decades before the main story, Gother who's lost his memories is found by a 16 year old princess Nadja Leones, the older sister of the current king Bartra. I warn you that Gother's story is one of the saddest and that's saying a lot when you're talking about the seven deadly sins. Nadja and Gother get to know each other and start falling in love. Gother eventually comes across his creator's chair and cries. Even though Nadja wants to, Gother doesn't want Nadja to give him a gift because he thinks that if she does, she'll disappear like his creator. However, Nadja promises him that won't happen and gives him a book to read. Books are a thing that connects the two. Nadja was never very strong and could never leave the castle, so a lot of her time was filled with reading books. She loves books. Gother finishes the book she gave him in moments. She thinks he's lying, but he quotes specific chapters and even changes his hair to look more like one of the characters. FYI, as a doll, he can change the shape, length, and color of his hair. He can also open up his chest and show people the magic heart that his creator gave him as a gift. This gift is supposedly imbued with the magic of the heart. He shows his heart to Nadja and Nadja faints. Gother helps her get to her room. When she wakes up, even though she knows Gother is a doll, she can't help but think how in love with him she is. She's so taken by him that it scares her. A kid Bartra smiles upon hearing this. Then Gother in a maid outfit appears and Nadja is embarrassed that he heard her. Bartra explains that Gother is dressed as a maid because that's the only way he wouldn't attract suspicion for being in the princess's room. So this is actually the origin of how Gother began dressing in girls' clothes. Anyways, Gother is happy that Nadja doesn't hate him for making her faint. He hugs her and he says that he would be lonely and sad if she left him. So yes, even though he's a doll, Gother can in fact feel emotions, as his tears along with his feelings of happiness, loneliness, and sadness illustrate. Gother continues to dress as a maid and stays close to the weak and sickly yet happy Nadja. 
Even other people around the castle, like her brothers, can't help but notice that she is awfully cheery since she started spending time with Gother. They do romantic stuff like dance and ride on horseback together. It is beautiful watching how selfless Gother is. He does everything, including impersonate the fictional character that Nadja loves in order to make her happy. And even though she'd love Gother no matter what form he takes, she greatly appreciates his efforts to make her happy. Alas though, the happily ever after ending was not to be. Gother was an immortal doll and Nadja was a sickly, often bedridden human. Nadja starts getting sicker. Although Gother thinks he's just an empty doll, Nadja assures him that what's inside her and inside Gother will never change. They share the same heart. Gother is inexpressibly sad and asks Nadja if she's going away. He says her heartbeat has been getting weaker by the day. The two start kissing, take off their clothes, and you can imagine what they start doing from there. So yes, to me it seems pretty clear that Gother the doll can in fact do that. Nadja eventually dies with a smile on her face, but not before revealing that Gother made her dream come true. Her dream was to spend her last days on earth with Gother. When Gother senses that her heart has stopped beating, he freaks out. He doesn't want her to die. He remembers what she said about them having the same heart and he takes out his own. He doesn't care what happens to him, but if his heart will help Nadja live, he is willing to give it to her. Of course, Gother's extreme extremely sad and sweetly naive attempt to bring Nadja back fails. The authorities come in and to them, it looks like Gother has deflowered and murdered the princess. As a result, he gets arrested for his supposed sin of lust. Like Bond, Gother experiences unbearable heartache after his lover's death so he decides to get rid of his heart and erase his memories. He thinks if a heart can hurt so much, then he wants to be nothing more than a doll. Gother's story is especially touching because he is so naive. He is so innocent and selfless that watching him fall in love only to lose it is so sad. We can't help but feel sorry for this doll, who clearly feels as much as any man could. Time passes on and even though he erased his memories and supposedly gave up his magic heart, Gother's heart continues to show itself in a variety of ways. For instance, some time after the sins were framed, Gother ran into a monster. Instead of killing him, he tried to help it by giving him his armor. Then, he was, for the most part, nice to a young boy called Pelio, after the boy helped him out. He looked after the young boy until the sins came to get him, and he was so nice to him that the boy cries when Gother has to leave. He even copied the boy's late mother's hairstyle and a traveling entertainer's speech and behavior in order to make the boy happy for as long as he could. Like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, Gother had a heart all along, even if it doesn't always seem like it. Next, we're going to be looking at Merlin, Britannia's strongest wizard. Compared to the Merlin from Arthurian legend, Nakaba Suzuki's version of Merlin looks like a hot 30 year old woman most of the time, and I'm probably not the only one who appreciates that change. Merlin was always surrounded by a lot of mystery, so her backstory was especially interesting to learn about. Like Gother, Merlin was around 3000 years ago. Merlin was from the city of Belialuin. Belialuin was the capital of the wizards. Her father was the elder sage and chief of the capital. Since Merlin was born with the amazing magic of infinity, everyone wanted her to be on their side. The wizards of Belialuin wanted her all to themselves, as did the demon king and the supreme deity. Against the wishes of the wizards, she negotiated with the demon king and the supreme deity. She tricked both of them into giving her amazing gifts by saying she would join them. The demon king gave her detailed information on all the secret arts and mysteries of the underworld and divine protection that could defend against the brainwashing of the goddesses, and the supreme deity bestowed the child divine protection able to nullify any and all manner of dark curses and commandments. Then, after she got the gifts, she disappeared having deceived two gods. As revenge, the Supreme Deity and Demon King worked together to utterly destroy the city of Belialuin. They rained destruction down for 1000 days. Poor wizards of Belialuin, they had nothing to do with the deception. They even asked Merlin not to meet with either god, and then they got punished, even though Merlin wasn't even in the city at the time. So in this way, you could say that Merlin was a glutton for knowledge and power, since she was willing to sacrifice her entire city in order to acquire those things. Merlin also knew Meliodas and the goddess Elizabeth 3000 years ago. She viewed Elizabeth as her big sis. Merlin was one of the first two members of the Seven Deadly Sins and she helped Meliodas find the other five members 16 years before the main story takes place. 
Merlin was also one of the first people to take interest in Escanor's monstrous strength, while most people just feared it. As a result, Escanor was extremely grateful and even fell in love with Merlin. At some point, she created Escanor's glasses that can keep him from transforming in the daytime, and she also created the enchanted armor that Gothar used to move around in. She even had time to support King Arthur, teach Vivian the ways of magic, and seal away part of Meliodas' power, among other things. She's always been an extremely impressive and busy mage. Next, let's take a look at the giant earthbender Deanne herself. Although she's approximately 750 years old, she's actually one of the younger sins. 700 years ago, at the age of 50, which is very young in giant years, Deanne left the giant clan because she hated fighting so much. She gets so lonely that she creates two golems out of stone using earthbending to keep her company. Then she eventually runs into Harlequin whose memories have been erased, so he doesn't know that he should be getting back to the Fairy King's forest since he's the king and all. Props to Harlequin for being able to be a king without ever being in his own realm. Anyway, since neither of them supposedly have anywhere to go, they get to know each other and become really good friends. They spend a lot of time together, many human lifetimes, and eventually Deanne gets sick. Fun fact, fairies don't get sick, so King is very worried about Deanne, since he's got no idea how to heal her. He decides that he needs to go get Deanne medicinal herbs, but Deanne holds him and won't let him go. She doesn't want to be by herself, so she asks him to stay with her. A human comes along and helps her out, and King, who mistrusts humans, thanks him a bit reluctantly. The old man's medicine works, and Deanne gets better. King and Deanne continue to play, and one day, Deanne rips her clothes, so King makes her some new ones. Deanne and King go to help the old man that helped them once, but he's dead, and even his grandchild has grown old and has kids of his own. This is when King and Deanne realize that what feels like the other day to them feels like forever ago to humans. It is around this time that Deanne learns about the human concept of marriage. It makes Deanne jealous and she asks King if he loves her. With a red face, he says he does. Then Deanne asks King to never stop loving her and he promises that he will always love her and stay by her side. She replies all she needs is for him to love her, which is good because King is about to leave. He soon sees a cart that reminds him of his past and he remembers everything. He remembers that he is the fairy king. He sees that there is trouble over at the human village and he goes to help. Deanne tells him to find their friends and bring them back safely. King promises to come back to her and Deanne cries tears of joy. King finds out that the person attacking the village is none other than his best fairy friend, Helbrum, who was getting revenge on the humans. King stops him and decides he needs to atone for his sins. In order to do this, he decides that he needs to leave Deanne even though he loves her. He erases her memories of him, so she doesn't miss him before letting himself get arrested. Deanne returns to the giant clan after that. About 16 years before the main story takes place, Deanne is fighting alongside the giant leader Matrona and her friend Dolores. The giants are hired as mercenaries by humans. It's the way they make their money. Matrona gets mad at both Dolores and Deanne after one battle because Dolores defeated no humans and Deanne defeated about 10 but didn't kill them. Matrona tells them that the giants are proud warriors. It is a giant's duty to seek out combat. It is a giant's dream to die in battle. It is a giant's nature to find life in war. To kill an opponent is the greatest honor a giant can ask for. Like Deanne, Dolores hates fighting, and she'd rather die than have to fight. Dolores is constantly falling behind the more gifted Deanne. Matrona thinks that she could eventually turn Deanne into the strongest fighter the giant clan has ever seen, but Deanne hates the way Matrona thinks and behaves. Deanne decides to leave the clan again and invites Dolores, but Dolores changed her mind about leaving. She says that no place would accept giants, so Deanne leaves on her own. Humans start to bug Deanne and Meliodas steps in before she can respond. He kicks their butts and insults them for ganging up on a little girl. Meliodas treats Deanne like an actual girl rather than like a scary giant, and this is why Deanne gets a crush on him. Keep in mind, her memories of King, who she loved, have been erased. Meliodas and Deanne hang out a bit, eat some food, and part ways. Deanne, after meeting Meliodas, wants to go tell Dolores that she's found a place that will accept them. However, her best friend is dead. While Deanne was away, she was sent to serve as a guard for a mining town. She was killed by some mountain bandits. Deanne punches Matrona in the face for sending Dolores to her death. Matrona hits her back and tells her that they have to participate in a wide-scale suppression of the savages with the Leonis Knights tomorrow. 
At this point, Deanne decides that she doesn't want to be like Matrona who glorifies fighting or like Dolores who would rather die than fight. Deanne will fight if she has to, but only to protect someone she cares about. Deanne keeps having flashbacks of King, but she still can't remember him clearly, the memories are all fuzzy. She starts to confuse the words that King spoke in the past with Meliodas, who was recently nice to her, and that is why she develops feelings for him. It is mainly because she is projecting her feelings for King onto Meliodas. Deanne, not super happy about it, comes the next morning to help the Giant Clan and the Knights of Leonis. However, it was all a trap that was set by the Knights of Leonis to take out Matrona, the out of control fang of the land. They begin to fight and Matrona ends up protecting Deanne from a poisoned arrow, showing that she is in fact a caring person. It turns out that Deanne's parents asked Matrona to raise her to be strong like her own little sister so that Deanne could survive on her own. And that is exactly what Matrona was trying to do all these years. As Matrona is succumbing to the poison, she wishes that she could think of something else to say, but she can't because all she knows is how to fight. And with that, she appears to pass away. However, she ends up having enough power to use one more amazing earthbending attack that creates countless spikes that impale about 330 knights at once. Matrona's last words are letting Deanne know that she could become even stronger than her. Some knights manage to escape and create a false story where they blame Deanne for what happened. When they are charging Deanne with the murder of Matrona, they say, Deanne of the Giant Clan, your envy over Matrona's power drove you to poison an important ally of the kingdom, and to keep your crime a secret, you brutally murdered 330 of the kingdom's knights." End quote. So it was because of this false story that she got the name Serpent Sin of Envy. However, if we recall, she was envious of humans when she learned that they could marry, and she is envious of Elizabeth near the beginning of the story because of the way Meliodas treats her. So envy is a sin that she truly needs to overcome over the course of the series. Anyways, after she is sentenced to death for her false crimes, Meliodas the Great Sinner comes to her rescue and takes her under his charge. Next, let's take a look at King's backstory since we already got a preview of it from Deanne's backstory. King was born around 1,300 years ago from the Sacred Tree. The tree chose him to be the third fairy king. About 700 years before the main story begins, King was a fairy king with little interest in humans and cautioned other fairies to be careful around them, while his best friend Helbram took a lot of interest in them and trusted them to a fault. Unfortunately though, some humans ended up tricking Helbram and his fairy friends. The human Aldrich wanted to take their wings, which can be sold for a lot of money. He killed a bunch of fairies and despite Elaine's warning, King left her in charge of the fairy forest so that he could go and save his fairy folk from the human threat. When he showed up, the place looked like a fairy graveyard, and even King's best friend Helbram looked dead. King was caught off guard by the eyepatch wearing Aldrich, and almost died. A young Deanne eventually saved him, but King's memories were temporarily gone, he no longer knew who he was. As we saw with Deanne's backstory, King and Deanne ended up spending centuries together and becoming really close. However, eventually Helbrim shows up to destroy the nearby human village. Helbrim thought that King wasn't alive all this time. He thought that the humans killed Harlequin, his best friend. He's been taking revenge on all humans this whole time. And King, the one who was always cautious about humans, is the one who has to stop him. With tears in his eyes, he appears to kill his best friend, and then in order to atone for his sins, lets himself get arrested after erasing Deanne's memories about him. King gets charged with the sin of sloth because he didn't stop the fairy Helbram. Instead, he went unaware of the tragedy and let it go on for so long. Meliodas is on the same carriage that takes King to the prison. Again, King can't really be blamed for not stopping Helbram because his memories were erased. But he could potentially be blamed for leaving his kingdom because he got too emotional when he saw what was happening to his best friend. Next we have Escanor, praise the sun! Escanor is actually the youngest sin and was born 40 years ago. He was a prince of the kingdom of Castelio. His older brother was absolutely terrible to him, probably because he took his shine and he was jealous. One day Escanor's sunshine powers awoke and he broke his older brother's arm. Escanor's body transformed into a much more muscular form and his parents went from doting on him to viewing him as a monster. His own mother no longer viewed Escanor as her son and the entire kingdom set out to kill him Frankenstein style. Only one person was nice to him, a woman named Rosa. She put him into a barrel and helped him escape. Escanor grew and even when he helped people, they just get scared of him and treat him like a monster. It was not until Merlin, who looks like Rosa, and Meliodas met him that he finally felt like he belonged somewhere. 
Merlin and Meliodas weren't scared of him at all. Rather, his powers made him more interesting in their eyes. Escanor, as we know, fell hard for Merlin, and he's loved her ever since. That's the short version, but recently in the manga we got even more information about Escanor's backstory. It turns out that Escanor's daytime form was blamed for destroying a number of villages and towns even though he was actually trying to save the people from a monster. People got scared of him and blamed him for everything, and when the Holy Knights tried to restrain Escanor, they got injured. In his daytime form, Escanor also showed disrespect towards the King of Leonis. As a result, he was charged with the greatest sin of all, pride, and sentenced to flogging and then hanging. However, as always, Meliodas came to the rescue and took Escanor under his charge. Escanor was the final sin to join the group. When asked what his specialty is by Bond, whether it's knives, a bow and arrow, spying, or assassination, nighttime Escanor responded poetry writing, which was absolutely hilarious. Escanor actually tries to escape during the night after Meliodas saves him, but Merlin stops him. Escanor fears that his daytime curse will hurt the Sins one day. He says he can't control his daytime form and that he shouldn't have been born. He thinks that Rosa should have just let him die instead of rescuing him that one time. Later, when Escanor transforms into his daytime form, Meliodas shows up in order to show Escanor that he doesn't have to worry about hurting them. However, Escanor punches Meliodas into Bond and runs away, worried that he accidentally killed both of them and hating himself for it. He wishes that someone would stop him and take his life while he uses a mountain as a punching bag. I don't know if there's any manlier punching bag than that. When night falls, Merlin comes to Escanor. Escanor tells Merlin that his cursed power is why he's alone. She asks him to join them, but he says that he doesn't deserve to after killing Meliodas and Bond. However, Meliodas and Bond show up, illustrating to Escanor that they're fine and not ghosts. Meliodas lets Escanor know that he's not the only monster around. All of the sins are monsters who are here to repent for their sins while living life to the fullest. Bond lets us know that the kingdom of Castelio was destroyed 20 years ago by barbarians, and isn't it interesting to think about how they chased away the only guy who could have helped them defeat the barbarians. If that ain't karma, I don't know what is. Anyways, Meliodas decides that he'll fight Escanor at noon and that will settle things. If Meliodas wins, Escanor will join the Sins, and if Escanor wins, he can do as he pleases. Full power Meliodas is able to overpower Escanor's The One Mode at this point, which is interesting information. Escanor is shocked that he can feel pain in this form, but Meliodas tells him that he can feel pain because he's alive. He can feel pain because Rosa saved him with her own life. He tells him not to be selfish enough to think that his life is his own. That is probably one of the most powerful lines and moments in The Seven Deadly Sins. I must say. Then Escanor finally says that he wants to live, and Meliodas smiles. Meliodas tells Escanor that he doesn't need to worry anymore, because he'll keep him in check. Then Escanor faints and travels to the world between life and death to visit the dead Rosa. He thanks Rosa for protecting him and says that he's going to live this life that she saved to the fullest. He says that no matter what tragedy befalls him or how lonely he gets, he will live on without being ashamed of this life she gave him. She tells him that there is nothing to be ashamed of and that with the sins, he'll no longer be alone. Rosa reveals that she's been watching Escanor all along. The side story chapter closes off with Escanor swearing to the gods that with the life Rosa gifted him, he will wager it for someone dear to him just like Rosa did. Paid forward style. Escanor, along with being one of the most epic characters, definitely has one of my favorite backstories as well. He's like Frankenstein's monster, but more epic, overpowered, and manly. Luckily, unlike Frankenstein's monster, Escanor found people who would accept him, and that made all the difference. Last, but definitely not least, we have Meliodas' backstory. Meliodas is the son of the Demon King, and 3,000 years ago, he was the leader of the Ten Commandments. He was the commandment of love, Meliodas was on track to become the next Demon King. It's funny actually, despite the fact that he is our protagonist, back then he had a reputation for being ruthless, evil, and terrifying, and even the four archangels of the goddess clan feared him. At some point, Meliodas saved Belion, the leader of the Six Knights of Black, from the strongest archangel Mael. Meliodas was strong enough to make Mael retreat, quite the impressive feat. Everything changed though when Meliodas met Elizabeth of the Goddess Clan. They fell in love and Meliodas abandoned his title as the leader of the Ten Commandments and his commandment of love. He was viewed as a traitor by the entire demon clan. 
It's like Romeo and Juliet with OP goddesses and demons. At one point, Zeldris confronted Meliodas, and Meliodas invited him to desert the demon clan with his lover Gelda. However, Zeldris chose loyalty to his father, and even turned on the vampire clan and sealed Gelda away when they became enemies of the demon clan. We are told that Meliodas killed two of the Ten Commandments at the time, probably because they tried to stop him during his escape. Meliodas leaving the demon clan created a power imbalance between the demon clan and the goddess clan, and that led to the holy war. So like Helen of Troy, Elizabeth indirectly started a giant war by getting Meliodas to leave the demon clan. Meliodas fought alongside Elizabeth, Droll, and Gloxinia as part of Stigma until the latter two joined the Ten Commandments. Meliodas became friends with the Bond lookalike Ro at some point. They even bumped fists together like Bond and Meliodas do 3000 years later. And although he knew that Meliodas was a demon, Ro could tell that he was a good person, even while his fellow demons thought that he was the worst scum that ever existed. Eventually, the Archangel Ludershell comes up with a plan to lure all of the demons into one place so that he could kill them. He captures tens of thousands of demons and uses them as bait to draw out the other demons, including Monspeed and Derriere. However, Meliodas and Elizabeth just want to stop the war, so they intervene, but not before Ludershell kills tens of thousands of kidnapped demons, including Derriere's sister, right before everyone's eyes. Ludoshell's plan is to destroy any chance of a peaceful resolution, and he almost succeeds. Commandments begin to fight Archangels, and then Monspeed and Derriere become Endura, sacrificing most of their demon hearts and sanity to beat the Archangels. Usually, they shouldn't be able to revert back to normal, but Elizabeth helps to save them, while Meliodas protects her from Ludoshell. Soon after that, the Gothers perform their Genjutsu, and Meliodas, along with everyone else, starts to believe that Miles actually is little brother Estorosa, who somehow managed to kill the strongest archangel, Mael. Around this time, the Demon King and the Supreme Deity cursed their children, Meliodas and Elizabeth, for their defiance and forbidden love. The Supreme Deity cursed Meliodas with immortality as his punishment, so that he gets revived every time he dies. On its own, that's a pretty crappy punishment. I mean, most people will do anything for immortality, but the immortality takes on a new meaning because of the curse the Demon King places on Elizabeth. He curses Elizabeth with perpetual reincarnation. She is fated to live human lives in which she always reunites with Meliodas, they fall in love, and she dies right before his eyes over and over again. The current Elizabeth, Elizabeth Leonis, is the 107th reincarnation, so Meliodas has already watched 107 Elizabeths die, and he never gets used to it. Although, we are told that some Elizabeths simply died of old age. Apparently, this is a fate worse than death for Meliodas, because he needs to watch Elizabeth die over and over again. But I feel like the fact that she comes back makes it less bad than if Meliodas simply had to live for eternity without her, but that's just me. About 16 years before the main story takes place, Meliodas was with Liz, the 106th reincarnation of the goddess Elizabeth. She was from the enemy kingdom of Danafor and she was sentenced to death, but Meliodas rescued her. They lived together and predictably fell in love. Meliodas said that she was the most important person to him. Interestingly enough, she was more violent and less shy than Elizabeth Leonis. Then entered the commandment Fraudrin. The people of Danafor broke his seal and Fraudrin managed to escape. He attacked Danafor and murdered Liz right in front of Meliodas' eyes. After Liz dies, Meliodas' rage causes his demon powers to go out of control. His power wipes Danafor off the face of the world, but Fraudrin manages to survive. So yeah, you could definitely say he earned the name Wrath. After, Meliodas finds a baby that is the new reincarnation of the goddess Elizabeth. Zaratras tries to help, but Meliodas warns him not to touch his woman, which probably looks pretty freaking weird. The baby Elizabeth is adopted by King Bartra Leonis, and Meliodas becomes a holy knight of Leonis so that he can stay close to Elizabeth. At some point, King Bartra has a prophecy about the seven deadly sins. Then, Merlin and Meliodas get all the sins together for the purpose of defeating the Ten Commandments if they manage to escape the goddess clan seal. The sins become the highest order of knights in the kingdom. They only answer to King Bartra and the great holy knight Zaratras. Then they go on adventures, one of which includes fighting vampires and seeing Zeldris' vampire girlfriend. Zeldris' girlfriend Gelda is resealed, and Meliodas can't help but wish that he was a better big brother to Zeldris, who was left to suffer so much on his own. Around 10 years before the main story takes place, the Sins had a mission that brought them into contact with the Druids, and the former goddess clan members Jenna and Zaneri. Zaneri developed a thing for Meliodas, but hey, who doesn't love Meliodas? Meliodas also served as a young Gilthunder's mentor. He trained him physically and mentally so that he would grow up to become a strong holy knight. 
Eventually, Meliodas, along with the rest of the Sins, was framed for Zaratras' death. Meliodas told the Sins to disperse and regroup later to figure out the true cause of his death and everyone obeyed. While they were escaping, a young Elizabeth Leonis tries to help them escape and gets extremely injured. This leads Meliodas to release his rage again, but luckily Merlin is there. She knocks him out and seals away a large portion of his power with the help of the aforementioned druids. According to Merlin, if she didn't do it, Leonis would have been completely wiped off the face of the earth like Danafor. So props to her, because even though it seemed like she was the cause of Belialuin's destruction, it seems like she did manage to save Leonis. Afterwards, Meliodas awoke and met Hawk. Hawk reminded him of his former bird companion, Wandle. The two became good friends and decided to open up a bar on Hawk's mama's back, since Meliodas could no longer work as a knight. Meliodas sold his sacred treasure in order to fund his startup business. Hawk made for a great business partner, whose specialty was leftover disposal. And that pretty much covers everyone's backstory up to the beginning of the series. This video took a lot more time than my usual videos, so I really hope you got value from it. Drop a like if you did enjoy it, and let me know what Sin's backstory is your favorite in the description. For more videos like this one, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you get notified when brand new 7 Deadly Sins videos drop. We have a 7 Deadly Sins playlist approaching 100 videos, so it's safe to say that you'll never run out of 7 Deadly Sins greatness, especially since we're always adding to the playlist. For even more 7 Deadly Sins content and crucial updates on the new seasons, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Anime Uproar. On the day I drop this video, I will have a tournament bracket through the Anime Uproar Instagram story function, where you will be able to vote for which backstory passes to the next round until there's only one left. So make sure to head over to Instagram if you want your vote to count because stories only last for 24 hours. I will do more of these tournament brackets in the future so make sure you're following us. Link to our Instagram can be found in the description and I'll probably do a pinned comment as well. A big thank you goes out to our patrons over on Patreon who help make videos like this one possible. I especially want to thank our pro hero tier patrons, the one and only Gilgamesh, nothing but a fan, Jason Wilson, King Zeldris, Angel Cruz, Steelers, Poet Pablo, Atropos Wraith, Fiddy Dalla Beat, Ekra GN, Anatoly Kazatsky, DJ Nathaniel, and Mateo, and are the one tier patrons, the ones who stand atop all clans, Steven Ingrata, Alola Anatem, Maddie Mac 239, Makota Kuhn, and your boy Seth. If you enjoy our work, you can support more of it by going over to patreon.com slash animeuproar and becoming a patron today for as little as $1. If you do so, you'll get your name featured in future videos alongside these amazing people right here, and you'll even get access to our private patron-only Discord. So check out patreon.com slash animeuproar, link in the description if you're interested. You can also now join the YouTube channel and support more content that way if you prefer. You'll get the same great benefits no matter which way you choose to support us. And until next time, see you space cowboys.